All right, can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Uh, so let's start. Uh, my name is Jagnesh Shah. Um, I've been working with Postgres about 11 years. Uh, we've done work with Postgres since Sun, VMware, and now Amazon. So uh, my topic is going to be uh, talking more about using Postgres in a managed service environment. Um, so a quick poll. How many of you are using any managed Postgres instances right now? How many are considering using that in future? Okay, perfect. All right, so I think that's the right talk for you to kind of learn more about it. Uh, before I start, a small disclaimer. Uh, these are my views and does not necessarily reflect the views of the company that I work for. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let's start, okay? So when you use Postgres, there are typically three ways to kind of uh, do that um, in the current environment, right? Uh, one is you could uh, do that on an on-prem device. The second option is you get the server in the cloud and deploy it yourself, and so it's kind of partially on the cloud. And the third way is a complete managed service in the cloud, right? Um, let's quickly look at the differences of all those three setups, right? Uh, when you do on-prem, you are basically taking ownership of everything to be done, right from purchasing the server, which sometimes takes like months, to kind of setting it up, which takes about weeks, to kind of then installing the database server, making sure you have the right configurations and everything, which could take days. By the time you are ready to use it, it could be a uh, in a fair amount of time, the, uh, the number I've heard from various people is it would be anywhere from two weeks to six month period on when they decide to kind of go with a server installation and when they finally are done and ready to use it. This is where cloud is very helpful, which is the next uh, way of deploying Postgres. So Postgres in the cloud is you spin up a VM somewhere in the cloud, you don't know where, you then log in into that VM, install your own Postgres version, and then you do all the patches or extensions that you need, and you, then you start using them. Um, so that is an advantage, because now you're not really uh, maintaining the hardware yourself. It is very quick, because all you do is pull out your credit card number, enter it in, and spin up a VM. So it's as quick as like doing that like in the, a uh, few minutes, uh, but you still spend time configuring the layout, configuring Postgres, uh, setting it up, making sure you're getting the right binaries and everything and setting it up. So you have essentially cut down your setup time from weeks to months to days. And uh, the thing is you still have to do a lot of things yourself. You still have to patch the operating system. You still have to patch OS with uh, any security fixes that you need to get. You need to patch the database as new minor version comes in. Um, and what essentially for the business that it means that they are not really spending that much time on the core business value that they want to do, but on administration side um, for maintaining the data for their business, right? And this is where I think managed services are really proving to be a boon as a value uh, proposition is that frees up businesses to focus more on their applications and not on the data administration side of it. Mind you, this does not mean that you do not need DBA. I've heard that term multiple times. Uh, it only means that you are basically offloading, managing your pure installation the backups, and uh, probably doing the patching work. You still need DBA. You need to know how a particular engine that you use works. You need to figure out how to do your own tuning and other things. But it greatly simplifies uh, life of a DBA. Uh, from what I've heard is, like, you know, in the old days, a DBA was managing one DB at a time. Then it grew up. They started managing tens of DBs. 
lately I've heard the number is rising to like hundreds of dB per dBA to like in some cases even thousands. So you know the number of dB uh, database uh, a particular dBA manages is increasing rapidly, and the way the managed database services help them is basically essentially scale out what they do as such. Yep, right. So I've talked about managed services, right? And we all know and love how to set up database. Now, what you want to know is, like, when I get a managed database service, what do I really get, right? And what am I losing? Or what are my kind of, like, you know, I've heard people say limitations. So let's kind of talk more about that in detail, right? When you get an instance, which is managed, essentially what you get is a locked down Postgres instance. Now, what I mean by lockdown instance is you do not have an ability to SSH into that OS of that managed instance, right? Do you need a reason to log in? I mean, yeah, I always had that feature, but uh, there are downsides of giving access to the OS out there, right? So um, think of it more as an appliance that you're getting. Um, you know, you basically, uh, how your router works, you just bring it, plug it in, start up, and start using it. You don't really try to log in and look at how it's doing its file system layout and kind of like tweak into that, right? So that's how the behavior, the experience of a managed uh, Postgres instance in the cloud typically behaves like this. Um, there are other advantages of that. You do not have any random software, which means there are very less likelihood of anything breaking for you. You you essentially get like a homogeneous deployment. It's kind of like a cookie cutter setup, right? You, you deploy it once, you test it out. The next time you deploy it, you essentially are kind of like getting the same thing again. So your experience is pretty consistent. So if you do kind of repetitive things again and again, um, there is no kind of like a, um, a chance like, you know, this might actually happen um, or behave differently as such, right? So that's the advantage you get with this uh, appliance-like setups. Uh, the other thing is, uh, which is actually great for enterprises, is they get the product uh, production auditing kind of capabilities, right? You now know if there are any changes happening on those instances, those are instantaneously logged, which means like uh, if there are issues that you want to track down, like, hey, who changed some setting or something like that, there would be a tracking that you could actually do that, which is great. I don't know how many times I've run into problems before, like somebody just changed a runtime variable um, out there, restarted the server, and then did something. And like two days later, something else broke, right? So uh, with this kind of uh, instances, you are actually getting more control that way. Is It's like you do get look, what we call as like the change uh, management tracking. Um, so it's kind of like an audit log on what are the changes that had happened on the instance, right? And the biggest advantage of everything is like, you know, it's more cost effective. The way you would end up uh, deploying them, um, when you do it on a massive scale, there is just cost optimization that you now uh, see out there, right? Um, the next thing out here is people do talk about super user, right? I, I think uh, in the earlier uh, sessions, I have heard about people talking about super user. Like, how many of you kind of are well aware of what a Postgres super user can do? Exactly. So uh, here's my analogy out there, right? Anything you can granular give out a role in Postgres, you do it to a user. When you don't know who should have the right to do anything, you give that power to the super user. So super user in many sense is a catch all of anything that uh, is not granted out to individual roles as such. Now. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, the advantage is uh, you always have a user that can do anything on the system. The disadvantage is the same. You can have a, a user which can do anything on the system. So essentially, that is one of the reasons why um, in a managed Postgres instance, you do not get the super user role as traditionally defined. Now, the primary objective of doing that is to make sure a user does not break into the OS shell, right? A super user actually has uh, all the rights as a user of that Unix system or Linux system to get into the system and change any files as they want. 
by limiting this, you are preventing people from breaking into the OS. Um, most uh, variants now would give out uh, uh, what is known as like a limited super user role, which has most of the capabilities that you can still do except for going into the OS side of that uh, role. So for example, you know, I still want to be able to terminate a query, and I need administrative rights for that. So you, you do get like what is known as uh, cloud provider specific super role that you can uh, um, grant it to a user, and you are still able to do those same things. Uh, that in some cases, there may be variations that you would do that. Like for example, uh, you may not get a direct access to pgconfig, uh, where you can change parameters dynamically, but you can still read and make special calls to make those changes. The reason for that is they typically go through an auditing layer, so it is tracked on who are making those changes. Questions on this? No, nope? good, perfect. Um, Interacting with a managed service, right? Managed service typically means that all your standard clients will work as it is. Um, so you can use any of your favorite client, PSQL, PG Admin, and PG SQL, JDBC driver, ODBC driver, anything that talks Postgres will talk with the managed service. Typically, there are no limitations on that. Uh, typic uh, what you would also see that for all the other administrative things, there would be a separate CLI provided, which would be doing more of the high-level administrative tasks. And those tasks could be, I want to reboot the Postgres server, right? That would be an administrative task. Uh, you wouldn't be doing that through the PSQL client, which means you need another client uh, access to do that in a programmatic way. So most cloud providers will give you a CLI access to do those administrative tasks. It could be uh, used for doing multiple things, uh, you know, kicking off a backup, uh, creating read replicas, promoting a read replica. So various administrative tasks uh, would be done through this uh, cloud-provided CLI. Um, using the combination, you, you should be essentially be able to automate everything you need to do. Um, the only caveat that you would see is like uh, the administrative user will have different credentials than your uh, DB super user. But that is because it is going through an infrastructure admin. So it is kind of similar to uh, what I call as the root access for your Linux system compared to the super user role. So this is how you should typically kind of uh, correlate them. Using the combination, you are now essentially able to do everything you could do on your regular Postgres server. Um, what I have seen is many people actually use the combination of the two to kind of write their own tools on top of that. Like, I want to do my own uh, 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 event monitoring, and based on this event, I want to trigger more replicas, right? So you could use this framework to kind of cook up your own workflows on top of this. So this is very possible, and many people do that. Yep. Um, so the next thing I want to do is uh, talk about is configuration parameters. So Postgres is famous for, hey, I have a problem. There is a configuration variable for that, right? You can tweak that, and you can fix your problems. Um, most of these configuration variables are actually provided through an, another setup in most cloud provided um, in the managed services. So you may not get full access for all the configuration parameters, particularly the parameters that you don't get to select are anything that needs to do with the OS path or any of those things, like a direct uh, access to a location on the disk or something like that. But most of the other parameters would be kind of provided through uh, mechanisms of an API to kind of change them. And you could actually select both, like whether uh, they would be applied for all future restarts, so it would be kind of like statically, um, you know, any static variables, like uh, most memory variables uh, would require a restart, so you could actually set them through the API and configure them. Few of them are still dynamic, which means they would be applied immediately out there. Um, that doesn't mean that an individual uh, Postgres user doesn't have a way of changing the parameters. Like you can still change all your session parameters as you can, depending on the role that you have. Like one of my favorite uh, tunable that I still use many times is, you know, for this workload, I want to turn off the synchronous commit, so I could actually just go into my regular 
uh, transaction, psql, disable it for that session, and run my transactions on using that. So it doesn't kind of do any limitation on that. I think what you really see is like you have a more controlled and audited way of the changes that are done. And also, uh, the benefit you get is now you actually have a parent template that you can apply to multiple instances at the same time, right? You do your test parameters on your dev and test setup, and then you can now say, okay, now I need to prom uh, apply the same thing to my production instances. So you now actually can use that same parameter groups to apply out there. So in a way, that it gives you more control on how you actually manage your servers. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about quickly is like, uh, you have now understood like what those apply, um, you know, instances look like. How should you go next on when you plan for your deployment, right? Um, typically, what uh, you would see is there are two types of deployments that you want to do. One is a dev and test setup. You know, fast spin up, I want to test out my application code. Once it's done, I want to spin them back or kill them, right? So these are what I call as like a dev and test uh, deployments. Uh, the advantages for them is like you want them to be super cheap, you want them to be super fast to spin up, um, do your work, and turn them down. Very uh, valid use cases that you see often out there. Um, there is a way uh, you could do that. Uh, it's, it's very simple, fast, and doable. The second type of application uh, instances that you typically would want to do is like your real production instances, right? This is where you would like say, I have compliance requirements to kind of do encryption on my production setups. I want to make sure that it has enough resources to kind of manage the load that it needs to do. So when you go for like tip, uh, typical production deployments, you would be answering more questions out there, which would be based on your requirements. Um, how many people actually do sizing exercises before you go on production deployments? Like run test workload, figure out how much you need, uh, and then deploy them. You should be doing more of that because if without doing proper sizing, uh, you would now have to kind of like figure out like, you know, take a guess. I'm gonna start with this instance and then go on to it there. Which is good, you could probably do that. But like, uh, yeah, what do you wanna know is like you need to do, uh, you have the ability to kind of select uh, the different parameters you want to do. Um, you can also do high availability setups, which are typically one-click setups that you can uh, set up for your production environment. So there is not much things to be done on your end. Basically, just select and click deploy. Now, we'll go into a little bit more detail, right? Um, now, for production deployments, uh, you, you don't want a single instance, right? You would basically have two reasons to do uh, multiple instance deployments. One is for high availability, which is you want to have like a, another read replica that you can quickly promote uh, in case of problems if you want to do that manually. The second thing is offloading your read queries, right? So you would basically do like a, a deployment with a read replica. Now, in the modern days, uh, there are uh, requirements that you would see that I also need to be DR ready, where you should have like an off-site deployment also ready to kind of take over if your whole site goes down. So this is kind of like one of the common things I'm seeing right now. Like people, when they do this production deployment, they do it uh, typically with one replica in the same geography as they are running a production environment, which is used for fast failover needs or you know doing off uh, uh, offloading the read queries, and then they would uh, also have a, a cross geography read replica more for DR purposes, like if a site goes down, like maybe the whole network pipe out there got lost, then they can quickly roll over to uh, off-site and uh, do a disaster recovery planning from that. Um, people also use that for disaster planning uh, testing that they do, so often what they would do is they would kick off the uh, read replica, cross-region read replica, and then do promotion to do DR test, which is actually a very common uh, enterprise uh, testing requirement that you have to do every now and then, I've seen. So that's kind of like the idea, you would use this to kind of uh, figure out like uh, what is the deployment architecture you want to do. Uh, the next thing I wanna do is like by default, uh, you know, we, uh, we all know that Postgres is secure, right? So oftentimes we do, uh, changes out there in your 
PGHBA configuration. I think how many of you uh, do those changes yourself? Right, perfect. Um, so how does this work in the cloud environment? Because I've talked about this, you do not get access to the files it's an appliance kind of thing, lockdown, right? So let's look at how uh, it is done in the cloud, right? The first thing we need to be aware of, uh, there are clear kind of demarcations that you would see on security. So there are two levels to way think of it, right? Typically the cloud provider takes the security responsibilities of the compute and the storage and the internal network. The PostgreSQL manager or the DBA will take the responsibility of making sure that all the external networks and the clients that are talking to the uh, server are kind of like in that uh, uh, list of trusted clients that you want, right? So the security is kind of like a shared responsibility between both the user as well as the cloud provider. Um, in the classic Postgres, you, you would use pghba.conf to do those same things. In a cloud environment, typically the cloud provider gives you another way, which uh, typically goes by a different name. It could be security groups, resource groups, uh, which would allow you to kind of uh, control who gets access to that server instance that you just created, and uh, 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 what are the authentication requirements for those, right? So uh, it is done more at a network layer in the cloud, and you would see that. Now, few things to be aware of, right? So, I mean, the, uh, um, the common way that I've seen many people do it is like they start making the databases publicly accessible. Uh, for a dev and test environment, that is okay to do. If you have a production environment, you don't want your managed database to be publicly visible. You do want to kind of disable um, the clients or the servers that can see that database server. So um, most uh, cloud providers will also give you their own virtual private network within the environment. You should be heavily using that. The public access should be restricted to your actual application web servers or application servers that are directly in the net. And the application connections to the, your managed Postgres instance should be coming through the private network between those two instances. So that it's a way to kind of kind of limit your exposure out there. Um, the other thing um, I've also run into in enterprises is uh, if you do want to make your database directly accessible, say for example, I want to use PG admin to connect to it. Um, often time, uh, corporate networks would not allow you to kind of connect directly to 5432. So often time, if you see like connection issues, uh, what I have found is it's more of uh, the corporation's firewall preventing anybody connecting to um, the 5432 port. Um, in those scenarios, you could actually try changing the 5432 port to a more standard port like 80 and try that out. And if you connect to it, and likelihood it is your corporate firewalls that's preventing the connection, right? Um, also, if you have applications that are talking uh, in different geographies, uh, you need to figure out um, SSL tunneling between those two regions so that you don't have to make your Postgres uh, instance publicly available on the net. Mind you, if you kind of put your uh, port open for everybody, there are countless bots running, trying to hack into your server, right? So the best thing to do is not um, make it publicly available. Can I, questions on that? Oh, good, right, good. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is actually um, sizing uh, your instances, right? We did, uh, I did talk about like you first should be doing your uh, testing on what kind of like requirements do you have on your resources for your manage, uh, for your database servers. Based on that, you should be selecting how many, how much CPU, memory, and I, um, you know, IO requirements your deployment will need. Um, there is a thing that said, right, throw hardware at the problem. When you run into problem, the simplest option for you is to bump up resources, and oftentimes you would see that um, improve performance. 
The downside of that is it will also increase the cost of your instances. Uh, most cloud providers charge based on your resources settings, right? So it will be like based on your instance size, based on your storage types. And, and it often way, it is a great way to kind of like, uh, you know, get past not tuning your queries. Like, I have a few things that's using CPU. Uh, what should I do? Well, I can tune my query and regain the CPU cycles back. Or I don't have time right now. I need to kind of up my CPU resources and come back to it later. Um, the advantage of actually using managed services, it's actually very easy to kind of scale up uh, your resources to kind of typical max. The standard limits would be your physical server settings uh, that you would uh, generally see. But for most cases, uh, uh, people will just go on increasing their instance uh, resources to kind of address those problems. The good part about using this in the cloud is like when you fix your queries and you don't require that high resources anymore, you are also able to kind of scale down at least your CPU and memory usages. So that is like a often quick way to kind of say, I'm gonna throw money at the problem, I'm gonna in increase my instance size, solve that problem for the low peak, uh, you know, rush load that I'm seeing. Once things are stable enough, if I want to kind of go back and lower my cost, I can actually go for uh, different CPU sizes. So that gives you an ability to kind of handle your short-term peak load that you're seeing um, for like, you know, special events during say Thanksgiving or, or you know, Halloween kind of events. Uh, and then you could go back to a, a regular instance to save money. So there, these are actually uh, possibilities that is actually quite popular in the cloud environment, but very hard to do in uh, actual on-prem environment. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is we did talk about like throwing, uh, you know, increasing CPU memory and other things. Um, if you know Postgres, uh, what you need to do is when you increase memory, you also have to do uh, changes in your Postgres parameters to make sure you're using them correctly. Um, the ones that I have frequently run into is like shared buffer settings. Um, many times they are, uh, could be set either to a static value, which means as you change your instance uh, resources, you are not availing of those uh, new uh, memory that is now available to you. Uh, the other issue that I've often seen is people do use that as a percentage of their actual instance memory, but based on like the number of connections you see, they need to be appropriately tuned. So irrespective of what um, you know, the default values are, you need to understand your own um, deployments you need to, the few things that you need to take care of is like, A, how much of concurrent connections do I have for my server? Uh, B, what kind of like queries I'm going to run? Are they going to be simple or would I require a higher workman? And using that, you want to kind of reevaluate the settings for that uh, instance as such. Um, if you do that wrong, your instance would be swapping, and that would be a big no-no not to ever go out there. If you do it right, you actually kind of like see the most optimum performance, uh, and you are basically scaling as your load grows on top of that. So it's kind of like the way. Uh, typically what I have uh, seen is like uh, workmen can be still increased uh, without any issues, uh, maintenance workmen. But the regular work mem, which is on a per connection basis, you need to be very careful on how you set them up. Oftentimes, uh, people bump them up significantly, and then they have high number of connections doing that, which would lead to kind of swapping in some of those cases as such. Uh, the next thing to be aware of is uh, the normal uh, vacuuming transaction uh, ID wraparound problem. Um, so you use vacuum for that. How many of you are aware of that? Okay, all right. So if you're not too aware of it, um, uh, Postgres uses a 32-bit transaction ID, uh, which kind of uh, uh, gives you the actual limit to 2 raised to 31 transactions that can be done, after which you need to run a maintenance utility called vacuum which will clean up all the older deleted rows in that. By doing that, then it kind of clears out 
more space for those transaction ID to kind of roll around and start reconsuming them. Um, this is a maintenance task. Uh, typically, you uh, you know once you go to manage Postgres instance, it's not your day-to-day -day job to kind of like worry about it. So you would typically set an alert for this to kind of look at it every now and then, and like you know once it crosses certain threshold, you receive an alert. Once you get an alert, you want to do vacuum. Vacuum would kind of like uh, uh, reduce that. Uh, uh, transaction differences, and you would be able to go on this. So this is kind of like one of the regular um, uh, maintenance tasks that you would see if you're working on managed Postgres that you still have to do. Um, just a quick note, um, vacuum only delays it. Um, it doesn't free up space uh, um, on the disk itself. If you also kind of want to free up some disk space, uh, uh, every now and then you want to do vacuum full, which is actually a heavy process. Uh, you cannot really have um, high workload uh, when you do a vacuum full. So you have to kind of time this properly as such. Um, if you have, how many of you actually have a workload that goes 24 by seven without any real up downtime? Uh, not many, which is good, which means auto vacuum will work for you. Like whenever you have a downtime in your uh, database workload, the, uh, there is a process called auto vacuum, which will kick in and actually do vacuuming for you. Uh, for most customers who don't have a 24 by seven, auto vacuuming just works fine, which means you don't run into transaction wraparound uh, ID issues. But if you have a 24 by seven, auto vacuum doesn't get a chance to kick in and do any maintenance task. In such cases is when you would typically see alerts like you know, your transaction ID uh, value or differences is growing fast, in which case you would want to tune auto vacuum to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, so the way you would typically do that is uh, there are a few Postgres parameters that you want to do and change them uh, to kind of help you vacuum them more uh, aggressively. How many of you actually have tuned auto vacuum before? Right, cool, thanks. Good. Um, when you run multiple replicas uh, for your instances, uh, the common other issue that you would see is um, it's uh, because most of the read replicas are asynchronous read replicas. Uh, depending on the load that you have, they may start to lag behind. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. One of the common reasons that I have seen is people often run uh, read queries on the replicas, which is what one of the popular use cases. When you are running read queries that run for a long time, and if there are, say, del uh, you know, updates or deletes happening on your primary, they would be pushed back. And VCC will take care of that perfectly, right? Everything is good. However, if there are changes like that and auto vacuum has kicked in, which means now it wipes out those deleted rows, uh, typically what will happen is they will actually now uh, cannot be applied on the secondary because uh, the queries are still running and consuming or seeing those MVCC views out there. So in uh, order to kind of like make, uh, you know, you have to kind of figure out uh, what real uh, thing you want to do. Do you want a low lagging replica? Or do you want to kind of like focus more on the read queries to finish properly, right? And you have the option. You, ha you can actually trade off. You can say, I want to make sure that my read queries finish before I apply the new changes. Um, if you do that trade off, what you would see is like, you know, there would be period of lags that would increase and decrease as time grows. Um, if your requirement is, I want to read replica to be as close as possible to the master because I'm going to use it for promoting, a, you know, for some reason, uh, you want to do that, then you want to kind of tune that replica a bit differently. What you would do is like, you would kind of say, hey, if any read queries that is taking beyond certain time, just kill them. I want to make sure that the replica is as close as the master. So you as a user actually get to kind of, uh, you know, set them, set each replica separately if you want, 
to kind of suit your needs out there. Many times it's actually very hard for people to kind of uh, um, you know, figure out the right uh, parameters to tweak. Uh, but oftentimes, like uh, you would see that uh, uh, um, there, are, uh, there is a, a less known variables in uh, less known configuration variable uh, values that you can uh, tweak for that. So the common is like uh, if you want to prefer your read queries to complete and you're okay with the lag, you would bump up the max standby archive delay and max standby uh, streaming delay. If you do not want to be kind of uh, you know, lagging behind, what you really want to do is, you know, uh, use uh, um, lower values for them, but also do more things like you would say, uh, increase uh, the wall keep segments, which means it keeps enough logs to catch up quickly. Uh, you would also use uh, uh, the hot standby feedback flag, which kind of gives you, gives the vacuuming the right information. So some of those things are happening directly on the master and they are kind of prevented from wiping out out there. So they kind of like are pretty close to each other. So basically at that point of time, your replica is indicating to the master, hey, don't kind of clean out this data. I'm still using it. Uh, and by you not cleaning it, I won't be lagging behind because I will still be taking all your updates um, as you kind of give it to me. So there are different parameters you can tweak depending on uh, uh, how you want to set it up, right? Um, the uh, recent one that we have seen, which is more popular, is turn on wall uh, compression. By doing that, you're kind of uh, reducing the network traffic between your master and your replica. So uh, because it would be sent in a compressed way, uh, the changes are happening faster uh, uh, by just optimizing on that bandwidth on how much bits it would need to pass out there. The other thing uh, you can do out there is increase your checkpoint timeout. By doing that, essentially the way Postgres work is once a checkpoint is finished, all walks are written with the full pages, right? So by increasing your checkpoint timeout, you are reducing the full page writes that are happening, which kind of again lowers the total number of, uh, you know, total wall traffic that you need to push to the replica and apply them. So these are some of the tweaks that you would use for using the configuration parameters of Postgres to kind of get either your replica in line with the master or kind of tuning them for your read, uh, read queries. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about kind of like the maintenance and other things. Uh, the next thing is actually moving data into a managed Postgres. Um, how many of you actually uh, use copy statement right now? What if I tell you you cannot use the copy statement as it is right now for managed Postgres? That would be a problem, right? Yeah. So uh, let's see how it's actually done. So when you're talking with uh, a managed Postgres, uh, you essentially are not using the direct copy uh, command, but you are using, uh, typically you end up using the uh, psql uh, client copy command out there, which essentially takes your local files and pushes it to the server, and the server then applies them through standard in. The copy command in Postgres is actually designed for reading the files on the server. Now, because you don't have an OS shell access, you cannot get your file to the server, right? So the way you would do that in the managed Postgres is you would use the slash copy, and when you use from file, what the psql client does is it reads it from your client and sends it to the server, and it will load it up. So this is how you actually typically load data into a managed Postgres uh, instances in the cloud. Um, the other option is if you are using P, uh, PG dump out there, you would uh, typically use the uh, PG restore command uh, if you're doing it in a custom uh, format dumps out there. And this is quite easy. Uh, one of the other things I've uh, seen people uh, struggle is that they take a dump using PG dump all. Now PG dump all kind of uh, assumes it's the super user, the Postgres super user and it will require the same Postgres super user privileges to load it back in. I already mentioned that you don't really get the same Postgres super user assigned to your um, administrative user, right? So in, in, in those scenarios, what you really want to use is like not use the pg dump all directly, but use the pg dump 
command to dump data from your source that you're trying to load data in. Any questions on that one? All right, cool. Cool. Uh, if you are actually migrating, uh, if you're actually migrating from a different database um, other than Postgres, uh, there are actually free tools available uh, that you could use. Um, so actually, the company that I work for has a great tool called Schema Conversion Tool. It's actually free. You could actually point it to a source database, um, and then it would create a Postgres schema out of that database, and you could actually apply that on your managed Postgres and create the whole schema as it is from, um, from a different database. And that could be any other database like Oracle, uh, MySQL or any other database. So if you are migrating from other database, this uh, utilities are actually quite good to help you migrate the data, right? Um, uh, so uh, what uh, the second part of that is like you once you migrate the schema, you would use some uh, migration tools to now dump the data from your uh, from your database in a different format, uh, convert it to Postgres and load it out. So uh, typically with copy, PG, uh, PG dump and restore, these utilities, you should be able to bring in data into Postgres uh, easily as such. Uh, quick things I wanna talk about is uh, backups, right? One of the things we uh, uh, talked about is like, you know, everything happens in the cloud. Now you do get one point, uh, one click backups copy or you can also automate backups. Most backups in the cloud work uh, in the block level format, so they work at the disk level, right? Um, uh, many backups that are done are done in combination of block as well as the wall archiving. So uh, what you would see, an option given by clouds is um, you have ways to do snapshots and then you can do point in time recovery. Snapshots, think of it as your full backups Point in time recovery are incremental backups from your full backup versions. So if, if you want to do a point in time uh, roll forward from a snapshot copy, you are able to do that. So when you typically restore, they give you like, you know, fast restore would be like doing it from a snapshot, quickly deploying it. Uh, if you do point in time, it will first deploy the older snapshot and then roll for uh, apply all the wall files after that. So that way you can, you have the flexibility of selecting um, um, either by the full backup, which will be very fast, or you could do to an exact point in time that you want to do restore back. So all those features are now very simple. All you do is restore, select, 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 done, and you actually get it. So that way uh, you no longer have to kind of apply manually all the ball files as such. It's, it's a good, uh, great uh, um, advantage to be able to do that. Um, so it depends on how they do the snapshot. You, uh, when you do a snapshot, you want to do both the block snapshot as well as archive all the wall logs that are happening separately from it. Uh, using the combination, you should be able to do that. Uh, some cloud provider don't do the full support. They only do the block level snapshot, in which case they won't be able to do point in time recovery. Yeah, I'll take the question answer uh, later on. Uh, yeah, I'm actually running out of time, so I wanna finish up and then we can probably discuss more. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is upgrades. Uh, upgrades are actually a great uh, feature that cloud provider gives you. And uh, when I talk about upgrades, these are not only minor version upgrades, but also major version upgrades. You could technically upgrade from a one point click from a 9.4 to 9.5 or at the click of a button. But there are various things to consider. Um, one of the uh, thing that I generally recommend is like uh, when you do an upgrade, do not do it on your production server itself, production instance. You, uh, your option typically should be to take a snapshot of that, restore it as a new database, upgrade it. Once your upgrade testing has finished, then cut over to that new database. By keeping the older one around, if there are any problems that you encounter during the upgrade, you still have the old one to fall back to, right? So in order to do that, there will be a good way to do that. There is a second option you could actually do an upgrade, and which I generally find more faster in the 
kind of like the time window that most people have to work in. Uh, you would actually start with a read replica, promote the read replica, kind of disable any backups out there, and then upgrade that read replica. And then once your replica uh, is fully upgraded, now switch traffic to the uh, upgraded one. Uh, typically what you would find, uh, I, what I have found is because the uh, uh, replica has been already been used up, uh, it is kind of like uh, fully hot from that point of view. So when the upgrade happens, everything happens smoothly. And, uh, um, and when you kind of like compare the actual time it uh, takes, I found like the upgrade, uh, upgrading the replica to be much faster uh, from a time point of view. So if you have kind of like limited time windows that you want to do for your upgrades, uh, this is one way to kind of actually do that. Um, I do want to talk about uh, quick some best practices for your applications. Um, I w one of the things uh, you should be looking at is each uh, managed uh, databases. Uh, uh, gives you DNS name. Um, one of my best practice is never use those DNS names directly, but create your own C name DNS entry for your applications. So that way, if you have 50 or 100 client connections, if something changes on the uh, managed Postgres um, in, uh, instance site, uh, for example, you kind of go into a different upgraded instance. You don't have to reconfigure all your clients. So a common best practice is to kind of use like a C name, uh, different DNS uh, for your clients and repoint them to the current instances. Um, the other best practice that I've seen uh, to be quite effective is uh, understand your application separate out your connections for read-write connections and read-only connections. Uh, typically, most applications, like especially Java, they have their own connection pools that are happening behind the scene. Uh, by doing the separation, now we have co uh, converted them into a different pool, and you could actually guide them, right? You could actually say all the read uh, connections will go to the replica, so that way you can do offloading qu uh, quickly as such. Uh, you have to start at the application layer to kind of like uh, make sure that you have architected your application so you know exactly which ones are read-only and which ones are read-write connections. Uh, a common caveat that I have noticed is like a, most people's a connection pool are kind of like a little bit dumb. They open up a lot of connections and keep them idle. Um, in Postgres generally, you don't want to keep too many connections idle. It ends up using memory. It, it ends up actually consuming, um, if you have high work mem, it ends up consuming too much memory on the system, which can uh, sometimes cause swapping out there. So uh, what you want to do is like if you have, if your connection pooler has features like max lifetime, max idle time, you should be using them. If you use them, you would actually see much more uh, better behavior uh, when you use managed uh, instances, right? Because uh, you are essentially not uh, having idle connections with lots of memory leaking out there and unused as such. Uh, the other things I've noticed uh, recently is, um, you know, a lot of people actually um, have too many different connection pools uh, set for each of their application. And this is where I think you have to kind of consider, like uh, when you have too many connection pools, Many of them go idle for a longer duration as such. At those time of time, you may want to consider a centralized connection pool rather than every application having its own connection pool. Um, this actually, uh, the advantage of this is you are, uh, you're cutting down uh, unnecessary database connections, which will help you save on memory, which will also help you kind of save uh, less um, problems that you would uh, typically see, like, uh, you know, you have so many connections, I don't know which one to kind of look at and see what they are doing. Um, so it, 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 it just makes your life easier out there. Uh, PG Bouncer is a good uh, centralized uh, option out there, which could be actually considered to do that. Um, oftentimes I've used that to kind of, um, what I call as like a weighted uh, instances uh, problem. Like if, you know, sometimes some applications are more heavy than others. Uh, the connect, uh, centralized connection pools helps you to kind of uh, fix that out. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is monitoring. Um, so 
Manage Postgres typically would give you all the monitorings and charts that you can actually uh, use and also create events out of them. So if any events are happening, you can be uh, paged or notified with those. This kind of helps you to kind of not really monitor them daily, but only when certain events happen. This is again a great uh, advantage of actually using uh, this kind of settings because uh, essentially most of the time they are on self-drive. If an event happens, you get notified and that's when you look at it. Uh, helps you cut down like the uh, time you have to spend on each individual databases. Uh, you should be keeping an eye on your logs and events that are happening on, the po on your Postgres instances. Many times uh, uh, there are a lot of SQL uh, errors happening on your setup. So periodically, you should still look at your error log files and figure out what is happening with your applications. Um, those are kind of like uh, use. Um, Manage Postgres still gives you access to all the Postgres statistics you can um, you need to know to kind of tune your workload. So this is where I say, you know, you still need DBAs who understand Postgres because you would be using the information from this databases to say, hey, is my buffer pool configured correctly? Is my uh, queries optimized, it, it doesn't have missing index. The um, cloud provider doesn't uh, really kind of like understand your data. They kind of do it at the infrastructure and the administrative task of it. From But the, date, the domain knowledge about your data model and what is right, what should be the access pattern, uh, you still own it. So you, are, um, uh, you, you still need to kind of look at all these statistics for that. Uh, with that, uh, quick two stories. Uh, 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 there are a lot of uh, customer stories of people moving into managed uh, Postgres in the cloud. Uh, one of the customers that we worked with uh, have, you know, tracks million, uh, one million vehicles on the road, and they push all the data uh, onto a managed Postgres in the cloud. Uh, they have been able to kind of like successfully convert over from other databases, move into Postgres, and that too into a managed service. Uh, there is another customer story out there, uh, which is a finance organization, uh, which kind of started with Oracle and completely then moved into Postgres. And they are also kind of moving, uh, moved to manage Postgres instances, which for which they are quite, kind of quite happy. So there are a lot of uh, user stories, uh, successful user stories in the, uh, out there. If you're interested, you could actually visit us at the Amazon booth. We would be happy to talk more out there. Uh, with that, I'm actually running out of time. So uh, thank you very much. Um, if there are questions, I'll be hanging outside and probably um, uh, you know, help you with more questions. Yeah, thanks.